Hello, and uh, thank you all for coming to this um, uh, presentation here at the Hopkinton Senior Center. My name is Arthur Bergeron. I do elder law for those of you who haven't been in one of my presentations. I'm uh, a lawyer at Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us at Myrick O'Connell. There were 40 in Worcester and 20 in Westboro. Um, and because there are so many of us, everybody gets to specialize and do what they really like doing. And so what I like doing is elder law, which is why I do these presentations. Um, these larger presentations are really meant to supplement the fact that I actually come here and actually give legal advice to people free if anybody decides to come to the Hopkinton Senior Center. But these are really meant to deal with a set of kind of global issues that I bump into all the time that you should know about. And one of those is this is this tension that uh, often exists between people who are trying to do planning for um, asset protection purposes, typically because they're concerned about mass health and about qualifying for mass health in the event that somebody needs nursing home care, and people that want to minimize their taxes. So I always talk about my same couple, my friends here, Frank and Mary, and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., and they have a very simple goal in life. They want to live in their, they got their house. They want to live in their house till they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. When Frank dies, he wants to leave everything to Mary. And when Mary dies, she wants to liquidate everything. That means turn it into money and divide it up among her kids. Does it sound like a pretty straightforward estate planning formula? So that's their basic goal. Um, and, and their basic, um, but their plan really is also that they don't, certain people they don't want to pay. They'd rather not, I've yet to find a client that says, oh, I really want to put in my will a a special bequest to the Internal Revenue Service. Oh, they do such a good job, you know, I just want to give them some money. So typically people don't want to be paying them. They don't want to be paying nursing homes. They don't want to be paying uh, for mass health as a result of nursing home care. Um, they don't want to be paying for probate. Those are the typical issues. Now, I'm going to mention probate and avoiding probate a couple of times in this presentation, but the core of this is about the tension between uh, qualifying for mass health um, and avoiding and dealing with tax issues. So we're going to talk about that a lot. Now, to start off, you need to kind of understand the basic mass health rules. Mass health, the reason why people, everybody knows about mass health these days, and they think about mass health is because mass health is the entity. It's the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program, and it's the entity that will pay for long-term nursing home care. Uh, if you are in a nursing home, um, unless you're there for less than 100 days, or unless, and unless you've been there because you were at the hospital first, your health insurance, including Medicare, will not cover a long stay in the nursing home. Medicare covers the cost of getting better, not the cost of staying the same, the same as all health insurance. So you really need to qualify for mass health. So a, a big piece of people's planning, especially if they've got assets less than $2 million, so they're not so that, they, they really, so that the possibility of a long stay in a nursing home really could affect them. Typically, in that situation, they want to know about mass health. So let me go through the basic rules. If Frank and Mary are both still alive, uh, and Mary goes into a nursing home, um, then the rules are that Mary, that Mary can qualify for mass health um, fairly quickly, uh, as long as she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. Frank, on the other hand, can own the home itself as long as it has a total value of less than 820 or a total equity of less than 828,000. He can have other assets worth 119,220. That's cash, stocks, bonds. And he can have infinite income. And therefore, if Mary uh, needs to qualify for Mass Health because she's in a nursing home, she can do so fairly quickly. She can always qualify. Uh, what she has to do is she has to transfer all of her assets to Frank. And then Frank can keep the house as long as the equity is less than $828,000, which applies to most houses around here. I do presentations in Nantucket where it applies to like no houses in Nantucket. Everybody's over that number. But here, it, most of the houses that covers it. Um, he can, he can he's gonna, if he has too much cash, if he has more than $119,220, then he needs to take the money that's over that number and buy an annuity. Typically, we advise people in this situation, take, keep about $100,000 and buy an annuity. Um, and, and, and as long as that annuity is for a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy, um, which is not based on his health at all, it's just based on a chart. There's a mass health chart. Every, this is the government, Every, this is the chart, right? So if he were 85, for example, his life expectancy would be about six years, his actuarial life expectancy. 
as long as he's buying an annuity that calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than his actuarial life expectancy, then the purchase of that annuity in any amount uh, is a legitimate conversion from an asset to an income stream. And so even if they have a million dollars in cash or cash equivalent assets, if he buys this annuity uh, and gets his remaining cash below $100,000, uh, Mary immediately qualifies for mass health. Now, the annuity interest rates on these annuities are terrible, just terrible. It's like 1% uh, at this point. As a matter of fact, no one would buy one of these annuities unless you're doing it in order to qualify for mass health. They're actually called Medicaid qualifying annuities. If you call the insurance companies, that, that's what they're selling you, right? It's something that will allow you to qualify for mass health. So the point is, Mary could qualify for, for mass health. So if, if, if this was their asset situation, for example, so they own a house that's worth $300,000, and the, he's got an IRA worth $150,000, uh, and they've got an annuity worth $100,000, and then their bank accounts are worth $100,000. So they get total assets of six fifty. dollars So in this case, that's what they could do. He would transfer the house to Frank. We'd transfer all the money to Frank. Frank would keep about 100,000 out of that um, uh, 400, 550,000, or, or excuse me, out of the um, uh, $350,000 that he has. He'd keep 100, buy an annuity for the other 250. And the day after he buys that annuity, Mary qualifies for Mass Health. And, and for a person in this kind of, and by the way, in this situation, actually, Frank could actually convert his IRA into one of these Medicaid qualifying annuities so that he could do that conversion without paying a tax penalty, without having to cash it out. So in this situation, that's typically what we would recommend. That's a very straightforward strategy and there are really no strong countervailing reasons to not do this, right? So why wouldn't Mary want to qualify for Mass Health in this situation? But say that their assets were a little different. Say that they had a house worth $400,000 they had a cottage on the Cape that they bought a long time ago that's worth $300,000. Um, Frank's got an IRA, but it's worth three hundred, dollars and Mary's got an IRA too, and it's worth two hundred. dollars uh, And there's an annuity that's worth a little more money. Um, it, there, it's actually a $200,000 uh, annuity, uh, and they've got the same amount of savings. So now they have a million five. So now the question is whether the, the cost of rearranging their assets in order to qualify Mary for Mass Health is worth it, right? They could still do it. They could still do it. He can keep his house. The equity is still less than eight hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars. We could turn everything else into cash, um, except a hundred thousand, and go buy a big annuity for like a million dollars. You can do that. I bought million-dollar annuities on behalf of clients and to qualify the other spouse for Mass Health. The question is, do you want to do that? And that really is related to some tax um, considerations. And by the way, here at Frank and Mary's income, that's going to be important as we talk about this some more. They, you know, Frank, and, Frank gets Social Security of $2,000 a month, so $24,000 a year. Mary gets half of his, $1,000 a month, $12,000 a year. The cottage generates some money, right? They use it sometimes, but they rent it out, so it's $10,000. Frank's uh, IRA generates, there's a required minimum distribution every year of uh, 3,000 and Mary's is two, and their annuity is giving them income of 4,000 a year. So their income is $55,000 per year right now, okay? So now we're gonna talk, so there, there are, um, what do Frank and Mary need to know in order to figure this out, right? And, and as I had mentioned earlier, this presentation, because it's really all about balancing out what is the best economic decision, inevitably involves a lot of math, right? So we're going to kind of play around with some math here. I'm not telling you what the, necessarily the right answer is, but just what the questions are that you have to ask. So to figure out this kind of balance, you do need to do a couple of things. You need to, you need to first of all, Frank and Mary need to do a kind of an income analysis about their income, right? Because if the cottage is generating 10000 a year, and they need to sell that cottage in order to get the cash to go buy the annuity because they can't keep the cottage, right? Well, then they're going to lose that, right? And then the annuity, remember, is paying them an income per year. And if they, if they sell that annuity to put all the money into one big pile and buy this Medicaid qualifying annuity, which only pays 1% per year, they're going to be losing some of that income. And then regarding the IRAs, uh, if Mary has to cash in her IRA, because remember in this example, she has an IRA as well as Frank, she's going to have to pay the tax on that. 
and then shift the money over to, before she shifts the money over to Frank before he buys this annuity. So you've got to kind of figure that stuff out. So a lot of this really involves doing a tax analysis. So we're going to talk about the three kinds of taxes that would be of concern here. Once again, there are their assets. We're going to, this is taxes 101. First we're going to talk about income taxes. Um, and then about capital gains, and then we're going to talk about estate taxes, and we're going to see how those all kind of fit into this pati these particular issues. First, income tax, the federal, federal marginal tax rates. Now, we all kind of have heard of this. Some of you actually know this stuff, but most people, including me, you know, if you're doing your tax return and you actually have to do it yourself, you just figure out your income and you go to the table and there's the amount and you pay the tax. So, there's actually a way that that gets figured out, and that is that your money, your income, gets divided up into little chunks, and each chunk gets taxed at a different tax rate. So there's the chart, the magic federal chart, of what those rates are. So the, your, ta your income tax rate on all of, if you're married filing jointly, on all of your income uh, below $18,000 is only 10%, right? That's not bad, right? On the next, um, on the money between $18,000 and $75,000, it's only 15%. Only when you start getting above that, so 75 to 150, it's 25%, 150 to 230, it's 28%, it keeps going up, right? Now, the reason why this is of significance uh, is we know Frank and Mary's income is $55,000. So, so Basically, the way the government would look at that money is they take the first chunk, the first $18,050, and tax that at 10%. They take the rest and tax it at 15, and there's their tax bill. Now, once again, this assumes that Frank and Mary have no deductions and no exemptions, right? Because otherwise, it just gets too complicated to talk about it, right? But so, so that's kind of how the, 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 in, the federal income tax works, and then the, fe, the state rate we're going to round, we're going to say that the state rate is 5% just because it's going to be easier to do the math. So that's income taxes. Now, capital gains taxes. A capital gains tax is a, a kind of income tax based that is paid only a cert, on a certain kind of income. It's the income that you make if you buy something for a little bit and you sell it for more and you keep it for at least a year. Then the tax that you pay re, at the time of the sale of that item it's called, the capital, it's called the capital gains tax, and it's based on the capital gain that you have. Now, how much is that capital gain? Well, let's see. Uh, what if Frank and Mary wanted to sell their house? Remember, their house is worth $400,000? So let's make some assumptions. The capital gain on that house, there's a formula for it. It's the adjusted sales price. That means the sales price minus commissions, minus legal fees, blah, 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 right? The adjusted sales price minus basis. What is basis? Um, the basis of a piece of property is what you bought it for plus what you paid in significant improvements to the property. Uh, what is significant, talk to your accountant about that, as to what, what it is exactly about what you put into the house that you can actually add to basis. Um, the capital gains tax federally is a little bit different, but we're going to just call it 20%. That's typically about right. And the Massachusetts capital gains tax is 5%. So the total capital gains tax, pretty much no matter how much you're making, is 25%. So how would that apply to Frank and Mary's house? Suppose that Frank and Mary had paid uh, $30,000 for their house. Make that, I have a lot of clients just in this situation. Right? They bought their house forever ago, right? Before all the high tech jobs came and all the values went up, right? $30,000. And they put $20,000 in improvements into it which seems like nothing now, but that actually could have bought you a spare room and stuff, you know, not that many years ago. So their, their basis is the combination of the purchase price and the improvement. So their basis is $50,000. There's, if their sale price, adjusted sale price, I'm assuming, don't think about commissions and the other stuff. Suppose their adjusted sales price really were $400,000. Their tax would be 400,000 minus the 50, or $350,000. Um, and as long as they have lived in that house for two of the last five years, um, they get a special capital gains exclusion, not by virtue of being old, but by virtue of having lived in the house that they own for two of the last five years. And that exclusion is $250,000 a piece for a total of $500,000. Now, I want to me mention this two-year thing because 
Um, although we're going to see this in some other examples, many people, many older folks, uh, will transfer an interest in their house to their kids um, because they want to protect the house for mass health purposes, because they know if they transfer an interest in the house and typically keep a life estate uh, and wait five years, that that interest that they transfer to the kids <clears throat> is not going to be counted if they need mass health care uh, or, or if they want to need to qualify for mass health. However, if they decide they want to sell their house, and so they tell the kids, well, would you give us back that remainder interest, you know, so that we can sell our house? And the kids say yes, assuming the kids say yes. Now they've got to live in it for another two years if they want to get the capital gains exemption, because they have to have lived in the house uh, uh, and, and owned it for two years prior to the date that they sell. So anyway, in this case, we'll assume that they've done that. So the sales price was $400,000, the basis was fifty. dollars the capital gain is $350,000. If there wasn't if there wasn't their house that they had lived in for two years, the capital gains tax would be 25% of that number, or $87,500. That's a big number. Um, but because they'd been living in it, right, um, th they wouldn't pay any tax. Now, suppose Frank dies, and then Mary goes to sell the house. Well, what happens in that case, it's important to kind of understand this concept. When Frank and Mary bought that house for $30,000, well, technically, for tax purposes, they each got a basis in that house of $15,000. Frank got 15 and Mary got 15. If Frank dies, his basis in his half of the property jumps to the date of death value. So if Frank dies and then Mary sells the property for that same $400,000, the way you figure out basis is, uh, first of all, as to Mary's half, Right? Mary, Mary had, Mary's, Mary's um, basis was, is half of $50,000, right? We, we were assuming that she, she they were both there for the purchase and they were both there for the improvement. So their total basis is 50. Mary's basis is half of that or 25. The other half, which was Frank's basis, now, of course, Mary now owns the whole property, but his basis at death jumped to his date of death value, right? With 50% of $400,000, which is 200. So her basis when she sells this house is actually $225,000. It's her original 25 plus this so-called stepped up basis that she got from Frank, right? So her basis is 225, her capital gain is 175,000, right? Remember Mary's exemption on her own is $250,000, which means there's no tax. Um, does, any questions on any of this so far? I know I'm kind of zipping through this, but I just I want you to kind of see how this how conceptually this stuff works. OK, so <clears throat> and so Mary is paying no tax. Let, by the, so let's say instead that Mary's house was worth eight hundred thousand dollars. Right. At the time that she sold it. But she had the same basis. Well, in that case, sales price is eight hundred thousand. Basis is fifty thousand. Her half of you know, her is 50 percent of, of her uh, is twenty five. 50% of the, of, of the new basis of $800,000, assume that Frank just died, is $400,000. So now the total basis in the house is $425,000. The remaining capital gain is $375,000. Um, and, 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 um, uh, and, and minus $250,000, which is her exemption, is $125,000. The capital gain on that one twenty-five dollars is $31,250. So in this situation, Mary actually would pay a capital gains tax. So the mere fact that you're in the house and that you own the house doesn't mean that you necessarily avoid the capital gains tax. It all depends on how much the capital gain is. Okay. Um, by the way, I'm just going to mention this. Say Frank, instead of owning half the house at the time that he died, owned the entire house. Suppose that, it, 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 and then he died. Well, in that case, if Mary sold the house for $800,000, the basis, which would have stepped up at, at Frank's date of death value, would be $800,000. And Mary would pay zero in capital gains tax. The reason why I mention that is that often I'll be talking to clients when someone's not feeling that great, you know, and it looks like that one of the spouses may be, may be going to die. So if you're in a situation where you may be concerned about capital gains tax, I had the situation on, on Martha's Vineyard, actually. We had a person who they had bought this lovely little co co a house, actually, in Oak Bluffs less than a block from the beach, worth about a million six. They had purchased it for two or three hundred thousand dollars, ages and ages and ages ago. 
Um, and he's sick. He's a Vietnam veteran. He's got um, melanoma. He's got cancer. So what we did is we had them, and, and, and she knows that when he dies, they're gonna, he's, she's going to sell that cottage. They live in Pennsylvania. She's going to move to Florida for the winters and stay in Pennsylvania. So we transferred the property to just him. And that deed got recorded actually one year ago uh, this week. Now, the IRS is aware of this, this, this issue that, you know, if one spouse if you, owns the property at the time of death, you know, the basis is, the, is 100%, it goes up to the whole value of the property. And so they said to themselves, wait a minute, you know, people are going to play around with this, which of course they did. And so they put in a rule that said that in order for Frank's basis to have jumped to the entire date of death value, he has to have owned the property himself for at least a year. So we transferred the property from the two of them to just him a year ago this month, right? Which means as long as he lives until Thanksgiving, if he then dies, Mary can sell the property in Martha's Vineyard capital gains free, right? If, he's, if, he, if he dies before the year, Mary's capital gains tax is going to be about $250,000, right? So you should just be aware you know, if it, it, there may be a re part of your planning may be, you know, if somebody is sick, to actually transfer property into the name of the person who is sick. So, uh, one more example. What happens if uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary inherit the home now from Frank and Mary or from Mary? Well, once again, going back to the original sales price, sales price is 400000 The tax basis in the property after the both parents have died would have jumped to the date of death value so the kids get the, sell the property tax-free. So there is an incentive, um, oftentimes, a capital gains tax incentive, especially if you've held property for a long time and the basis is really low, to save it until you die, which really is kind of balanced off against any incentive that you might have to sell it in order to qualify for mass health or for some other reason. Um, so now you've got the capital. Any questions so far in any of this part? Okay. So now we're going to talk about one more concept that's related to this, which is called depreciation recapture. And this has to do with the cottage. This has to do with the cottage. So there's Frank and Mary's cottage. It's on the Cape. They bought it for like peanuts, right? A long time ago, they would always use it, but they would rent it for most of the year so they could take a write-off, right? What, is, what does the write-off mean? It means that they can, they'll earn some money in rent, but, but, the, but the amount that they pay in taxes is the rent minus their expenses and minus depreciation. What is depreciation? Depreciation is an amount equal to a percentage of the value of the cottage plus the improvements, which they actually are required to subtract uh, every year that they declare that they've earned income on this property. That's called depreciation. Now the interesting thing about depreciation though is that once the property has been depreciated, if you go to sell that property, as to the amount of the property that's been depreciated, you pay tax not at the capital gains rate, but at the ordinary income rate, right? That's called depreciation recapture. Because the, the idea was this, this, that otherwise, before this, this happened, people were, this was the big incentive to buy real estate, buy income producing real estate, is you depreciate down the property and therefore you're not paying tax on the income you're making. But then, you, and, and, and you're saving money at ordinary income rates, and then when you go to sell the property, you're only paying tax at capital gains rates. So everybody was making money on this differential. And so that, that, this, this, this capital gains recapture was meant to kind of avoid that. So we're going to talk about the cottage. Say that they bought the cottage for $100,000, for $100, and they put another $100,000 in improvements into it, and they've had it like forever. And so they've depreciated the property down the, the depreciation um, table, you depreciate at a certain percentage of the value of the property or of the basis of the property, and the maximum length of the depreciation is less than 30 years. So we're going to assume that they depreciated this property down to zero. So now let's look what happens if they sell. Um, if they sell for $300,000, uh, their basis in the property is zero because while they had bought it for a hundred thousand and put a hundred into improvements, they depreciated that all down to zero. So their basis is zero. So their, but their gain gets divided up into two separate piles. Um, the pile that is depreciation recapture is two hundred thousand dollars. 
The rest gets taxed at capital gains rates, right? Remember the capital gains rate is 25%. How do you figure out the depreciation recapture? Well, you go back and look at Frank and Mary's income, right? Remember their income was $55,000? Um, but now, the year that they sell that cottage, their income goes up by $300,000. Their income the year they sell the cottage is $350,000. So the way that they would calculate their tax the year that they sell the cottage is they would take that, 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 um, the $200,000, right? That is the depreciation recapture money and kind of put it on top of their other income. And if you figure, figure that out, then they would pay a, on a little bit of that money, they'd pay at 15%, the amount between 55,000 and the top of that, that uh, federal bracket, which was about 75. And then between 76 and, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, a higher amount, they're paying at 23%, and, then the, and it, uh, that's on the next $76,000. And then on the top $103,000, they're paying at 28%. So their total tax on the depreciation recapture is $51,000. That's on that 200,000 that got recaptured. On the other 100, they're paying the standard federal capital gains rate of 20,000. Their total capital gains at the state level, remember, is 5%, so that's 5% of 300,000, that's 15. So their total tax, if they sell that cottage for 300,000, is $86,000, right? It's a huge tax, so they pay a huge tax penalty by virtue of having to sell the cottage. What happens, though, if Frank and Mary die owning the cottage and then the kids get to sell it? Well, we've done this before, right? Basis jumps up to the date of death value. Adjusted basis is, or the stepped up basis is 300,000. The sales price is 300,000. The kids pay zero in tax. So there's really an incentive. And, 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 if, if, and if just Frank had died, then the adjusted sales price would be 300,000. Frank's basis, remember, would have jumped up to his half of the value which would have been um, to $150,000. The, the remaining amount of tax would, be, would have been $150,000. So they've been paying much less in tax. Um, if they both die, as we've discussed, there's no tax to the children. So built into all of this, when they're trying to balance out whether they want to qualify for mass health versus not, is this issue because so, they're going to pay a ton of money in taxes that they would not have to pay if they held the cottage until the two of them have died. Now, if they're qualifying for Mass Health, once Mary has qualified for Mass Health, she is saving, in terms of her nursing home costs, probably about $10,000 a month. So if, we were, if Frank were assuming that Mary was going to live for a long time in the nursing home, then all of these tax hits are worth the trouble because they pale compared to the amount that Frank would save if on Mary, and Mary would save being in the nursing home on Mass Health. If, on the other hand, Mary is not in good health, is in the nursing home, and may die soon, that happens a lot. The, 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 the median length of stay in a nursing home is less than two years. A lot of people die in a matter of months. Well, then it makes a lot of sense to simply pay privately and not go through this. So, that's all the capital gains, that's the income tax, so now we're gonna throw in one other piece, by the way, that everybody also has in the back of their mind, the Massachusetts estate tax. Now you will probably have it, once again, in the back of your mind, that there is an estate tax. The federal estate tax is irrelevant to just about everybody now, because the exemption amount is $5.4 million, right? But the Massachusetts estate tax applies to all estates above a million dollars. And so if you've got real estate, typically, you're over, right? Or if you've got a big IRA or 401k. And so people kind of know about this. They know that the Massachusetts, they know something about there's a million dollars that doesn't get taxed, right? And so we're gonna talk about that a little bit so you can understand how that works. So the Massachusetts estate tax actually applies to all the states having a value of more than $40,000, four zero, $40,000. Reason for that is historically, the Massachusetts estate tax, like the federal estate tax actually, were created uh, in the early 20th century. People were concerned about accumulated wealth, very much like now. People were concerned about you know, a, these families accumulating gigantic amounts of money. 
um, and then simply passing it on to their kids tax-free. And so you had these kind of huge bastions of wealth. And so the idea was that, it, it, well, certainly you deserve to keep the money you earned. At the time you died, the government was going to capture some of that, right? And so in Massachusetts, the government started capturing money once, you, once the estate was more than $40,000. And, and, and on, now, they didn't capture a lot, right? On the, fir, on the money between $40,000 and $90,000, you paid eight-tenths of 1%. And between ninety dollars and $140,000, 1.6%, just twice of that. And then it slowly goes up. And look at the line when you get to a million, between $840,000 and $1,040,000, that chunk of money, you're only paying tax at 5.6%. Now, this chart is still in the law, right? It's still there. This chart never got changed. Um, what cha and, and so, by the way, if you're Frank and Mary and you've got an estate of a million five, your estate tax is $68,240. And it really is. That's still the law. That's still how you compute it. Um, what happened, though, was that real estate started going up. Now, it, took, it was not for a long time, but real estate started going up kind of in our lifetimes. You remember like the 50s and the 60s? And all of a sudden, things started taking off. And, and the state started realizing that their constituents, everybody that died was paying an estate tax. If you had a house, you, you ended up having to pay an estate tax. And so what they did was they passed a, 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 a law that said, if you have an estate that's less than a particular amount, and that amount, I think, originally was $100,000. It was, it was fairly low. Then you paid no estate tax. Now, over time, uh, because values have continued to go up, especially because house values have continued to go up, the legislature has changed that number and worked it up. It was 600000 Now it's a million. It's been a million dollars, I want to say, since the late 1990s, around 2000, right? So now, if you have an estate that's worth a million dollars or less, you pay no estate tax. So then the question is, what if you're a dollar over? What if you're a dollar over? What if you have a million and one dollars in a taxable estate? Well, in some states, which had basically many states did exactly what Massachusetts did. They had these charts, and then they just imposed this number below which you didn't have to pay. In some states, like Maryland until, or excuse me, Maryland, like Rhode Island until about a year ago, they had what was called a cliff tax. Uh, their, their magic number was $650,000. If your value was less than that, you didn't pay an estate tax. If you were a dollar over, then you paid all the tax you would have paid up to $650,000 using their chart. So you fell off the cliff, and all of a sudden, instead of owing zero, you owed like $35,000. So in Massachusetts, instead of having a cliff tax, they, bas they said, well, we're going to have this like alternative. We're going to say, once you get over a million dollars, we're going to charge you in estate tax the lower of what you would have paid on this chart or 40% of all of the dollars over a million. So in other words, the marginal rate on your first dollar over a million dollars is 40%. On your first dollar, you pay 40 cents in tax. On your first 100,000, you pay 40,000 in tax. And then there gets to be a point where the lines cross. So uh, we talked about that. So once again, over a million dollars, it's 40%. So to give you a sense of this, so if you have an estate, a taxable estate of a million dollars, and you looked at the table that we just went through, you would have owed 36,560. Um, if, if you're saying 40% of all the dollars over a million, well then that's zero because you only have a million dollars. And therefore, um, your tax is the lower of those two, so it's zero. If you had an estate of a million one hundred thousand dollars, and you use that table that I showed you, the tax was 42,640. Uh, if you took 40% of all the dollars over a million, that's $40,000, 40% of that $100,000. And so the tax would be 40,000. You always get to pick the lower, and therefore you get to pick $40,000. You get to a million two, it's within that bracket that things change, right? So using the table, it's only $49,000 that you pay. If you were paying 40% of all the dollars over a million, you'd be paying $80,000, 40% of those 200,000. The lower of those is 49,040, right? So that's where you're back to basically that old table that I showed you, the same table. So on an estate, going back to what we said earlier, on an estate of $1,500,000, the total estate tax is only $68,240. So 
The estate tax is, it, you need to figure it in, you know, but it's not like a huge amount. And typically when people are picking today between the benefit, especially if you've got appreciated property, the benefits of taking that step up in, the, in, in basis of your property versus paying the estate tax. Typically, you want to pay the estate tax. Typically, you want to pay, because by paying the estate tax, you get the step up, which ends up saving you a lot more money. So um, in terms of the balancing that Mary, Frank and Mary are doing right now, they need to figure out, remember, the sale of the cottage is going to cost them $86,000. The surrender of that old annuity that Frank has may have a surrender charge. And most importantly, um, he's going to be losing the 5% return that he had on that annuity, which was paying him the $10,000 a year. Um, there are the, the, if Mary is cashing out her IRA, there's going to be a tax hit resulting from that because she's going to get all that income that year. All $200,000 is going to get added to her regular income. Remember, she's going to get paid, paying that money on that, on that graduated federal rate. So she's probably going to be paying 33% on that money if she has to cash out that IRA, right? So there are all of these costs on one side, and then there is the savings on the other side. What is, you know, what is Mary's benefit, right? So that's the kind of, and, and that's the kind of, of, of comparison you need to be making when you're trying to figure this stuff out. Finally, in terms of, of their pre-crisis planning. So Frank and Mary are coming in and they're saying, well, you know, we'd like to be sure that if one of us needs nursing home care, we're going to be safe. Um, well, one possibility, because, you know, the big, the big tax hit here is, is the cottage. The big tax hit comes from the sale of that cottage. One possibility would be to gift the cottage right now to the kids. Now, the problem if they just give the property to the kids uh, is that um, they are giving, if you make a gift to someone of appreciated property, whether it's stock or real estate, you're giving them your tax basis. So in this case, if they're giving the kids their very low tax basis in the cottage, these kids, and when the kids sell the cottage, basically, they're each going to get a third of the proceeds, but they're going to get taxed differently, right? Because remember, you take the, the, the majority of the money, the value in the cottage is in, is in this recaptured depreciation. You would divide that by three. Uh, assuming that Peter was in, a, was in a high income bracket and was making 250, he'd be paying 33% on that money. Paul might be paying less if he's making less. Mary might be paying much less if she's making less money. So effectively, if they're giving the kids the cottage, they're really, in terms of the dollars involved, giving the, the daughter who is making much less money, a much bigger gift because her after tax dollars are gonna be much higher than her big brother who was making a really a lot of money. So that may not be the best strategy. There is a second possibility, which is, and we, we had mentioned this earlier, they could transfer the property to the kids and retain a life estate in the property. If they do that, then A, five years after they've done that transfer, then the interest they transfer to the kids is not going to be countable for mass health purposes, right? They keep a life estate in the property. B, when they die for tax purposes because they kept that life estate in the property, at the time that they sell the property, or at the time that they die, the tax basis in that property is going to step up. So they're going to have saved all the taxes they would have paid on the property, right? by giving the property to the kids and retaining a life estate. So that's one strategy. A second one is actually to transfer that interest instead of transferring it to the kids, to transfer it to just one of the kids in an irrevocable trust. And you've all heard about irrevocable trust and things. So there are a number of strategies regarding all of these assets that you can pursue. But the key coming out of this is to be understanding that when you're doing that, you're trying to balance these interests, right? Which one is better, to sell now or to sell later? We talked about, you know, there's, 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 there's no disadvantage to them to selling their house right now. We talked about the fact that if Mary were to sell the property later on, she'd be paying a tax. Um, there's, there's, I'm not going to talk about qualified personal residence trusts. So, bottom line, when you're trying to figure this out, whether because you're in crisis mode, because someone's going to a nursing home, or whether you're doing pre-planning, you really need to be talking to a set of people. You need to talk to an elder law attorney who can help you figure out how the mass health piece could work. That's a crucial piece of this. But don't necessarily ask the elder law attorney how to figure out all the taxes. 
And conversely, don't ask your accountant necessarily how to figure out the elder law piece. Oftentimes people talk to me and they're doing this kind of planning, like in crisis mode, and I'm explaining to them what they need to do in order to qualify Mary for Mass Health. And they'll come back and say, gee, I talked to my accountant. He says, I absolutely can't do that because I'm going to pay all this money in taxes. And, and I'll tell him, I say, well, I get that. I get that you're going to pay some taxes. But the question is, is that cost outweighed by the benefit of getting Mary on Mass Health? Similarly, the investment person. Uh, we lawyers as well as accountants are often asked for investment advice. That's a bad place to be asking for investment advice. We don't know. We don't know, right? That's your investment guy. Similarly, you don't want to be asking your investment guy to be an elder law attorney and to be saying, because I've had that happen, where the investment person will say, oh, we can't sell this. We're getting a terrific rate of return on this annuity and blah, blah, blah. And I'll say, well, yeah, except that if you get rid of the annuity, you can qualify for mass health, and that's going to be saving $10,000 a month. And pretty soon, that really outweighs this great investment opportunity. On the other hand, I had a, a, a woman who came in and she was, she was trying to figure out whether to qualify her mother. Her mother had a little over a million dollars in assets uh, and they were getting a terrific rate of return, like, well, 6% six, six to 7%, so 60 to $70,000, right? And a lot of the money was tax deferred money. So that if, they, if the mother was gonna have to cash that out in order to go and buy this other kind of annuity that we were going to need, she was going to be taking a big tax hit. So she was going to be losing not only this rate of return, but also taking a big tax hit. And we waited out and, and realized that since the mother was probably not going to live for more than a year or two, on the whole, it made more sense to pay privately. She could have qualified for Mass Health, but it made more sense to pay privately. So those are the balances that you need to figure out. Um, if you got just overwhelmed by this, but you actually want to see it again because you want to see the math, um, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel. It's called Elder Law Frank and Mary, and you can go see it anytime. And remember, the goal of all of these is always to help you sleep well at night. So hopefully this has, if you had concerns, certain kinds of concerns, you can at least figure out that maybe it's time to talk to somebody and get some advice on it. Thank you very much. I know it was a little dry. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it's been a pleasure being here in uh, 2015, and we'll look forward to seeing, or in 2016, I'm getting old, you know, and we'll look forward to seeing you here next year. Thank you.